Welcome, and thank you for listening to Sandy Creek Stirrings. I'm your host, Joshua Jimenez. And if you're going to win souls, you've got to love souls. In spite of their meanness, in spite of the way they look, in spite of everything, you've got to seek to bring souls to Jesus Christ because you love them, because Jesus loved them, and because Jesus died for them, and you're trying to bring them to the Son of God. The Bible says in Psalm 84, 11, my last verse, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. I based my whole life on that, that it pays to serve God, and I believe that law of my heart. God has given us a guidebook. God has given us a directional map, and that guidebook, that map, is the precious Word of God. Listen, don't just go and sit in the pew. Find some way to serve and serve as a family. Be a part of everything at church, and when you learn to love what God loves, um, your children will learn to love it as well. Homes are not that spiritually strong. We're getting overtaken by the world quickly, but unfortunately, we're pumping all the sewage in. You know, we're letting the world in when that ought to be a haven. Thank you for joining me here again on Sandy Creek Stirrings, a podcast where our goal is to stir you up for the cause of Christ through practicality, reality, and sincerity. I have another message for you today that I preached just recently at our church this past Sunday night. It's a message entitled, Dealing with the Scars is what it's labeled as on our YouTube channel for Victory Springs at Epitaph Baptist Church in High Springs, Florida. Um, but I think for this podcast episode, I'm going to label it, I Love My Master. I think that may fit a little bit better with the message. We do talk in that message about dealing with the scars, dealing with the scars that come from serving the Lord. And you say there's scars from serving the Lord. Well, why don't you listen to this message today? And I pray and hope that it will be a blessing to you. I've heard from several people that it was a message of healing and helping them to heal and helping them to remember where their focus should be. And so I pray and hope that this message is a blessing to you today as well. If you have any questions, you can always send those in to Joshua at sandycreekstirrings.com. Again, that's Joshua at sandycreekstirrings.com. Until next time, my friend, hey, keep looking up and keep stirred up for the cause of Christ. Exodus chapter number 21. I was up this morning and drinking a cup of coffee. How many of you are coffee drinkers in the morning? And I was drinking a, a pot of coffee. My wife and I, our, our coffee pot broke and we got one of those coffee pots that's a thermal coffee pot. And, you know, it brews right into the thermal thing, and it stays hot all day. You don't have to leave the, the coffee pot on. It's just fascinating. You know, I've watched, how many of you have seen Little House on the Prairie, the old, old show? And Charles would always come in, and he would go to the stove, and he would always pour himself a cup of coffee. And we were watching that one day, and I told Tapta, I said, I want to be one of those guys. I want to just go into the house and just pour myself a cup of coffee. How he got up in the middle of the night and drank a cup of coffee and went back to bed, I'll never know, but he did it. And so this just pretty fascinating, but I was sitting there drinking a cup of coffee this morning and go over, going over my message that I already had written out. It was entitled, Are You a Servant of the King? And um, But that's not the message the Lord had. I was going through and I was studying it, and uh, I'm sure you've been this way, preacher, and I'm sure you've been this way, Brother Munson. Uh, I sat there and I was going through it, and I finally pushed it back and I said, this isn't what the Lord wants me to preach. I, I don't know. And Brother McCoy, I'm sure you've been there as well. This, I, I just knew this is not what the Lord wants me to preach tonight. And so I had a thought and I tracked that thought down and I finished typing out that thought uh, at four o'clock this afternoon, about an hour before I left the house. And I, I told my wife in the car, I said, I know, I, I know beyond a shadow of the doubt, this is the message the Lord wants for tonight. And I told her, I said, but I don't know why. And uh, we're going to find out why the Lord wants this message preached tonight. Not that it doesn't have truth, but I'm interested to see how the Lord applies it to your life. I know how He's applied it to my life, and I know how it's touched me. But I'm interested to see how it touches your heart and your life tonight. Exodus chapter number 21, and we will start reading in verse number 1 after I get a sip of water. Exodus chapter number 21 and verse number 1. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years shall he shall serve. And in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. 
If his master hath given him a, a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges, and he shall also bring him to the door, or unto the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. I love my master, my wife, and my children. I will not go out free. We're going to talk tonight. I, I, I don't know what the title of this message is. I think Mark put down, dealing with the scars. I have written at the top, I love my master. I don't know what to call it. There's a bunch of things we're going to talk about tonight. So if you'll listen attentively, I promise we'll be finished at a decent time this evening, definitely before midnight. And uh, But let's pray and see what the Lord has for us tonight. Lord, I do thank you for this evening. And Lord, I thank you for a time where we can gather together and just to meet together to sing praise and worship to you, to fellowship together, and Lord, to hear your word spoken. Lord, I pray that you'd please speak to the hearts of the people here tonight. Lord, as I preach, I pray that you'd even speak to my heart. Lord, I don't want people to walk out tonight and say this was a message from Brother Josh, but Lord, that this was a message from you. That's what I want people to say. Lord, so I pray that everyone here tonight would be listening attentively, not for what I say or what I've seen, but Lord, for something that you would give them this evening that can touch their lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Exodus chapter 21 is, of course, right after Exodus chapter 20. And it uh, didn't take a whole lot of math to figure that out. And uh, But Exodus chapter 20 deals with very famous passage, the Ten Commandments. And often we can just look at the law as a base set of Ten Commandments when really there was many, many, many more commandments than just those ten. But we might say those ten are the foundation. Those are the first things you want in your life, and you build on top of those ten. If you can't have those ten in your life, you're going to have a really hard time with the next hundreds and hundreds of commandments that are going to come. In Exodus chapter number 21, we begin to find that God begins giving some rules and some laws for people who are enlisted in service. And so in Exodus chapter 21, God begins to outline some of these mandates for servants. I know many people who I've talked to them, and they do not like the Bible. They don't like God. And one of the things that they'll use for fodder for their argument is they say that the Bible endorses slavery. Anybody who says that simply has not researched out the topic and they don't know their Bible. Uh, nowhere do you find the Bible endorsing slavery. In fact, what you find is you find slavery or servanthood in the Bible as completely different than what you and I know of as slavery in American history. Two completely different things. God was very particular on how servants were to be treated. In fact, when you go to Ephesians and chapter number six, you'll find the Bible says that the master's should love their servants and they should forbear with them. They should treat them kindly. God was very particular about a, how, what, how a master should treat his servants. There was certain ways he should treat him. There was certain ways he should care for him. He was responsible for caring for his servants. That's a different kind of quote unquote slavery than you and I have heard of, isn't it? And I even find that there were time constraints for how long a master could keep a servant. Look here in Exodus chapter number 21 and look in verse number 2. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. I find he could only keep a servant for a max of six years, and then he had to let him go. That sounds pretty good for slavery that people talk about, isn't it? Well, most people, when they talk about that, that's something completely different than what they're thinking in their mind. And God begins to give some things about this servant. You can see we're, we're reading about a man here, a, a manservant, and we're reading about him, and he, he comes to the end of this six years. He's able to go free, he's able to leave, and he has a decision to make. He can either leave his master, or he can stay and serve his master forever. 
You say, why in the world would he want to stay and serve his master forever? That makes no sense. Let me give you a few reasons why. Number one, I find the reason is that he would have care in the master's home. He would have care in the master's home. Biblically, this master was responsible for caring for the needs of his servants. He was responsible for their housing. He was responsible for their food. When they were sick, he was responsible for their doctoring and for their medicine. He was responsible to meet their needs. That was on the hands of the master. He was responsible for this. And so when a servant said, you know what, I think I'll just stay. By the way, there were some good masters in history. There were some good masters in history. There were men who treated their servants so well that they weren't even necessarily servants as much as they were hired hands, you might say. And they, at the end of their, at the end of their time of service would say, you know what? I think I'm just going to stay with you. You've treated me really well. This master was responsible for the care of this servant. That's one reason why that servant would want to stay. Number two, I find another reason that servant would want to stay is the blessings of service. There were some things that, yes, if this servant left, he could go out and he could probably find another place to live. And yes, if this servant left, he could probably go out and find some other kind of food that wasn't at his master's home. But there were some things he had received by being a servant at his master's house that if he left, those blessings would leave with him. You'll see there that it says in those verses that if the master gave him a wife, she was obviously a servant too. She had her time that she had to serve. A lot of times if they got into debt and they had no other money, they would sell themselves as a servant. And they would work off that money that they had indebted themselves to. She would still have time left. That, that she was responsible to stay with her master until her time was done. And so if that man said, you know what, I'm married, I have children, she, the master allowed me to marry that servant, and he left, she still has to stay and serve her time. He's leaving behind a wife and child. By the way, that wife and child were a blessing of being a servant. He would have never met that lady had he not been a servant. He would have never had those children had he not been a servant. And so there were some blessings that were frankly irreplaceable. He couldn't replace that wife that he loved and he adored. He couldn't replace those children that he had raised as his, in his time of service. Those were irreplaceable. Those were blessings that came only from being a servant to that master. That's the second reason why he might want to stay. And when he made his decision to stay or to leave, when he made that decision, he got three things. If he decided to stay, number one, he got the care in the master's house. He got the blessings that come only with, with service. And then number three, he received some pain and suffering. He received some pain and suffering. You say, what do you mean? Look down in verse number six. Then his master, he's made the decision. He says, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Whether he liked it or not, this, this pain, this suffering that he would have here was part of the package. It was part of the deal. When he decided, you know what, I'm going to stay with my master. He's been good to me. Notice what he said. He said, I love my master. That shows you what he thinks of his master. The master would then take this servant, they would go before the judge, and they would make a contract. The servant would serve his master for the rest of his life, and that master would care for that servant for the rest of his life. That's the deal they made. And how did they know that this man had made that decision? They would take that servant, and he would, of his own accord, go up to the doorpost or a piece of wood. He would put his earlobe over that door, and they would take an awl, think along the lines of an ice pick, and they would take and they would bore a hole through the ear of that servant. How many of you, that's a wonderful thought? You're like, sign me up for that. That sounds great. And um, some people ask me, Brother Josh, did you ever think about getting piercings? No, I'm scared half to death of needles. Like, why would I purposely put a needle through my ear? That sounds terrible. Uh, people ask me, Brother Josh, were you ever tempted to get tattoos? 
No, that's needles multiplied over and over, drawn across my body. That sounds terrible. I, I never wanted that. Uh, needles, like, I, I just don't want to see any. I don't want needles. I don't even like getting shots. And uh, needles, no way. But think about this. This isn't the little machine. I, I remember when my sister Brenna, I think you were six or seven or eight, and she decided she wanted to get her ears pierced. And we all, family event, needles family event we all go to walmart back when they would do ear piercing i don't even know if they do that anymore and she sat down on this little stool and they took these little staple gun looking things and they put her over put them over her ears and they went click and they punched that needle through her ear and it's like that it's done this servant didn't have the little staple gun thing i would not have the little staple gun thing. this servant didn't have that his master would take an awl, and as I said, think along the lines of an ice pick, and he would stand there as a hole would be bored through his ear. This was a mark that he would serve his master for the rest of his life. He would serve his master for the rest of his life. I want to give you some facts about this pain that the servant would suffer. Right, Because it was painful. It wasn't pain-free. There was no deadening shot they gave him in his earlobe, and you're not going to feel this at all. Uh, they probably gave him a rag and said, here, bite down on this. This is really going to hurt. And uh, But there's some facts about this pain. And letter A, if you're writing this out in an outline, letter A, all faithful servants suffered this pain. All faithful servants suffered this pain. As I said, I don't know about you, but I have no desire to go get my ear bored out with an all. I, I have no desire to do that. I would never do that on purpose. But this is something that if I, back in those times, if I was a servant and I wanted to stay with my master, this was part of the deal. This was part of the package. There was no getting around it. In fact, it wasn't necessarily lonely for me to do either because there was probably many other servants. If my master was a good master, there were probably many other servants who had endured this pain, who had gone through this suffering, who had received the mark of a lifelong servant. I find letter B that the, another fact about this pain is the pain did not last forever, right? It, it didn't stay bleeding and, and maybe even infected. It didn't stay bleeding for the rest of his life. At some point it would heal. He could pull on his earlobe. He could maybe stick his finger through it. He could do whatever he wanted to do. It didn't hurt anymore. The pain healed it. It wasn't a lifelong pain. It was a pain that lasted for a short period of time and then it would heal. And then letter number C, I find this pain caused a scar that would last a lifetime. It wasn't going away. It was going to stay there for the rest of his life. He would have that scar. He would have that mark of what he chose to do. And it, this scar, whenever he saw it, it reminded him of two things. It reminded him, number one, of what he suffered. He had suffered uh, being put up against a piece of wood and, a, and an awl bored through his ear. That's what he suffered. He would remember the pain. How many of you have ever had a scar and you remember the pain? You can still feel it to this day. You still remember what happened. It may have been when you were a child, but you remember the pain. You may not be able to see it. I don't know if you can, but I've got a little tiny scar, maybe half an inch right here above my eyebrow. When I was a eight-year-old kid, we lived at a, a stilt home. And the stilt home, the stilts, had these cement blocks around the base of these stilts. And I remember a neighbor kid and I were throwing the football, and mom called us in for dinner. His mom called him in for dinner, and he ran across the street to go to dinner. And so he was crossing the street, and I was throwing the football up in the air. Dad was burning some leaves. And I remember I was throwing the football up in the air. You know how you're kind of watching the kid go across the street. And I, all of a sudden, my foot hit something, and I turned, and I fell, and I hit the corner of that stilt. I hit the corner of that post. All I remember is everything went black for about a second, and I opened my eyes up, and I could not see out of this eye over here. And I remember I, I, I looked at Dad, and I, I said, Dad, what's wrong? And that was when I saw fear in my dad's eyes for the first time. And he looked back and apparently had blood dripping all down my face and I had blood all in my eye and I couldn't see and I had gashed open my head. I still remember it. I still remember what it felt like to get that scar. This scar this man had, it reminded him of what he had suffered. It reminded him of the pain. But then secondly, the scar reminded him of why he suffered. Why he suffered. He suffered because he loved his master. 
He suffered because he loved his children. He suffered because he loved his wife. He suffered because it was a choice he wanted to make. He suffered because his master had been good to him. And though this was a little bit of pain for a little time, now he got to live in that master's house that he loved, that was a blessing to him, that cared for him. And though that pain was there for a short little bit of time, now he could dwell there in that place. It reminded him and it pointed him back to the master. You say, how does that apply to me, Brother Josh? That's all very interesting. I didn't know that. How does that apply to me? Let me give you the spiritual application. You and I, whether we like it or not, are in service. You say, yes, I'm in a church service right now. No, you are in a service. You are a servant. And you are either a servant to sin or you're a servant to, Paul puts it, a servant to righteousness. Turn over to Romans chapter 6. And Paul begins talking about being a servant to sin or a servant to righteousness in Romans chapter number 6 and gives us how we can stop being a servant to sin. Romans chapter number 6. Verse number, verse number 16. Know ye not... Romans 6, verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to him ye obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Notice this, verse 18, Being then made free from sin... Ye became the servants of righteousness. Go down to verse number 22. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end of everlasting life. When we are born, we are born in the chains and the bondage and the service of sin. You say, I don't like that. It does not matter what you like. You say, I don't want that. It does not matter what you want. You are born with a sin nature. You are born in the bondage and the service of sin. If we could put it this way, you're down there in the dun not, not in hell, but uh, figuratively down in the dungeon of sin. You're in chains, you're in bondage, and it doesn't matter. You don't have a say in it. That's the way you're born. The Bible says, for all have sin and come short of the glory of God. We're servants of sin. But aren't you thankful that God made a way? Notice verse 23 there, just going down one more verse. For the wages of sin is death. God says when we sin and the service of sin, the wage, the paycheck we earn is a death in hell forever. But aren't you thankful the verse doesn't end there? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul tells the Galatians, he said, Hey, ye were servants of sin, but now being made free. You say, how do am I made free? I'm made free through the blood of the Lamb. I was condemned. I was guilty. I, I gave an illustration last Sunday at junior church of a, of a judge standing there at that, at that seat and he's got the gavel, he's got the hammer in his hand and I stood there in front of him. I was a sinner and he looked at me, that judge, and he said, hey, are you guilty of being a sinner? I have to say, yes, I'm guilty. And the judge says, okay, here according to the law, if you're guilty of sin, you deserve death and hell forever. And he goes to slam the gavel down, and then somebody stands up over here. And it's the judge's son. And he says, hey, wait a second. I'll take his place. I'll take his place. I'll die for his sins. I'll go to, I'll go to that cross and die for him. And I remember that day back in March of 2000 where I knelt down on my knees and I, instead of being a servant of sin, I accepted the gift that Christ gave to me and I became a servant of God and a servant of righteousness. Have you had a day like that? By the way, if that day doesn't get you excited, your wood's a little wet. It should get you excited. It should get you excited when we talk about salvation. But then we have another choice. You've gotten saved. You're a servant of God. You have another choice. Who will you serve from this day forward? Who will you serve from this day forward? You're like that servant in the story in Exodus chapter 21. You have a choice. Who am I going to serve? Do I love my master and am I going to serve him or am I going to go back to that old sin? You know, it's incredible how many people God pulled them out of that 
service of sin and set their feet upon the solid rock, amen, and set them free. And now they're a servant of God. And now all of a sudden they say, oh, that's great. You know what? I'm just going to go back here. I can't lose my salvation, so I'm going to go right back here. You say, that's not, that's impossible. No, no, no. Paul said, be careful that you use not the grace God has given you as a liberty and an occasion to sin. God says, who are you going to serve? If you remember Joshua and Joshua chapter 24, the children of Israel have left Egypt and the bondage there. By the way, Egypt always being a picture of what in scripture? Sin. They left the bondage of sin. They've come over to the promised land, the victorious Christian life. And Joshua with his, some of his last dying breath says, choose you this day whom ye will serve. They had a choice. Will you choose to serve God or will you choose to serve the gods of the Canaanites? Who are you going to choose to serve? And my friend, I'll give you the answer. Here's the right answer for you. When you stand at the crossroads of who am I going to serve with my life, the answer is you should serve God. He gave you everything. He set you free. Everything you own belongs to Him, and He is deserving, and He is worthy. He is a good master. There's blessings flowing from Him, and so I think I'll just stay and serve Him. Everything I have belongs to Him anyway, and everything I have, He gave me anyway. And whether it be my time, whether it be my children, whether it be my marriage, whether it be my home, whether it be my finances. And by the way, there's a lot of people who aren't willing to give their finances to God. Can I remind you, the Bible says in Proverbs 22 and verse number 7, the borrower is servant to the lender. And you know, I'm afraid that sometimes we get so involved with what we want and what we desire that we rebind ourselves with whatever it may be and we can no longer be the servant to God that God wants us to be. I, let me give you an example. We're, t we're talking about finances there for just a second. I see some people who are so wrapped up in being a servant to Capital One and a servant to the Ford dealership and a servant to Rocket Mortgage that when God says, hey, why don't you give... A you know, $50 to that missionary. They're passing through. They could use it. And we say, I can't do that. I can't do that. I, I don't have the money. And there's some people, they literally don't have the money. You know why? For some people, it's because they've, they've, they've made themselves a servant of all these things over here. They can't serve God the way they need to. That's why it's wise financially to avoid as much debt as possible and, and free ourselves from that because when I'm a borrower, I am a servant to the lender. There's a reason God said you cannot serve two masters for ye will either hate the one or love the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve God money. You have to pick between the two. And frankly, tonight we're at the crossroads of who are we going to serve with our lives? And there's some things that you need to know when you choose to serve God. Number one, why should, you why should you serve God? What will you get from serving God? What comes from serving God? Write this down. Number one, you'll receive a caring of the master. You'll be cared for by the master. You say that's the same point you gave before. It is because the same thing is applicable to you and I. Your needs when you say, God, I will serve you with my life. God says, okay, here's the deal I'll make with you. If you'll serve me with your life, Brother Master said, I'll care for your needs. Brother Ross, if you'll serve me with your life, I will care for your needs. We often forget. We think it's our job to provide for our needs. And I'm not telling anybody to go out and to be a lazy bum and live under a bridge. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, He that will not work shall not eat. All right, I believe in being a hard worker. But at the end of the day, you know who's responsible for my needs if I stay faithful to him? God. Hey. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19 says, But my God shall supply all. Oh, isn't that wonderful? My God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God provides for my needs. Amen. And if I stay faithful to Him, and if I serve Him with my life, He says, you know what, Josh? Your needs, I'll provide for them because you are in my care. Just this afternoon, I was sitting here typing out this message and working on it. And we had just run out of the proper sized diapers for victory. If you have a baby, you know diapers are important. All right. I wouldn't recommend life without diapers on a baby. And but we ran out of the proper sized diapers. And all of a sudden I got a little knock on the door. I walked to the door, and Brother Nelson back there was standing there with a box of two hundred and ten diapers. And you know what? They were the right size. 
how he knew. I didn't tell him, Brother Nelson, you need to go get me some diapers. I didn't say, Brother Nelson, I'm out of size four diapers. I didn't. I mean, why would I tell him that? And that'd be weird. But I didn't tell him that. You know what? You know who told him and laid that on his heart? God did. And you know how God provides for your need? He uses people. And so I thank Brother Nelson, amen, but I thank God too because God provides for my needs. And you know why? Because I said, God, I'm going to choose instead of serving what I want and instead of choosing what I desire, instead of serving me, 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 I'm going to serve you. And God says, that's great. I'll provide for your needs. The second thing he promises is he promises the blessings that only service can provide. The blessings that only service can provide. There are some things God promises to people and only to people who dedicate their lives in service to Him. And you say, are you talking about like full-time ministry? No, I'm not talking about full-time ministry. You can be a dump truck driver, a garbage truck driver. You can be a stalker at Walmart. Not a stalker, but a stalker. S-T-O-C-K-E-R. Y'all, I don't know why y'all thought that. To me, that's just, do y'all not call them stalkers? I call them stalkers. And a stalker, they're putting the cans up on the shelves, not the crazy, deranged people walking around following people. All right, let's just make that clear. I feel like I just lost all of y'all there for a second. I'll put it this way. The guy's stalking the shelves. Y'all must not like my accent. That's what it is. The guy's stalking, like a stalking, like a stalking on the fireplace. The guy stocking the, the cans on the shelves. You can still be in the service of God, amen? It means you're serving God with your life, whatever God has for you. You don't have to be in full-time ministry to serve God with your life. God says, though, if you'll serve me, there are some blessings you can only get by serving me. In fact, write this down. I'll read it to you. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 and 24 says this, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward. Of inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ he said hey there is a special reward for you who serve Christ you say what are some of those rewards I wrote down a couple not all of them because we could just read the Bible and it's filled with them and I'll, I'll give you three I see number one a fulfilled life comes from serving God so uh, first Corinthians chapter 15 verse 58 says therefore my beloved brethren be ye steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There is a sweet peace in knowing when you lay your head on the pillow at night and you got done with a day of serving God and you say, you know what, Lord, I gave you my best. I served you today. I did what you told me to do. I dedicated my day to you. There's a sweet peace in knowing when I lay my head on the pillow at night, I did what I was supposed to. And though some things may not have worked out the way I wanted them to. Brother Brent was talking the other day how difficult it is. Uh, sometimes we can go times where we don't see a whole lot of people saved, and then we see a bunch of people saved, and then we don't see people saved. And it just seems like during those times of what we might call soul-winning droughts, that is it really making a difference? God tells you this. Remember, your labor is not in vain. It's not empty. It's not empty. And there's days where I go back and I say, well, I wish this would have happened. There's Sundays where I'm back in junior church and nobody gets saved in junior church. And I go to bed and I say, you know what? I wish somebody would have gotten saved. But God says to my heart, hey, it's not in vain when you labor for the Lord. There's a fulfilled life. I see, I see another one is the fruit of the Spirit is a product of serving God. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meek meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. If you want a peace that passes all understanding, if you want a joy that just won't go away, try serving God. It's a promised blessing. I see there is a crown for people who serve God. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 8 says, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith, or I have finished my course, and I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in, at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love His appearing. There is a crown in heaven for those who are willing to serve God. There's so many others, but there are certain blessings that God promises to give that only come by serving Him. But then here's the part you may not like. Not only do I get cared for in his house, and not only do I get the blessings that come from service, but then number three, I will receive some pain and some suffering. 
And you say, Brother Josh, I thought you were trying to help me make the right decision. This is the right decision. But I, I can't come to you and lie to you and say that when you get saved, it's, it's going to be just all wonderful. And it's going to be Peter Pan. Think of a wonderful thought. And you'll just fly away into the Never Never Land. Uh, that's not the way this Christian life works. When you choose to serve the Master, can I just be honest with you, and I'm not trying to scare you away, there will be some pain and some suffering. There will be some pain and some suffering that comes along with it. The Bible says, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. God says, hey, you want to live a godly life? Hey, you want to serve me? Can I just warn you ahead of time, you're going to suffer some persecution. The Bible says Jesus was telling his disciples in Luke chapter 17, verse 1, then said he unto his disciples, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. Offenses will happen. Pain is just part of the package that comes along with serving God. Can I give you some facts about that pain? Letter number A, all faithful servants suffer this pain. Does this sound a little bit familiar to the outline I gave earlier? All faithful servants suffer this pain. The Bible says, yea, all and all that will live godly. It doesn't say some that live godly. It says all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Can I tell you this? Sometimes we get into pain and suffering and we say, God, I chose to serve you. Can I tell you this? Don't get the woe is me syndrome where you say, I'm all alone. I'm the only person suffering. I'm the only person who made this decision and I'm suffering for it. And the pain, that's a bunch of hogwash. That's just a lie from the Satan. That's just a lie from Satan. He wants you to believe that you're all alone because when you think you're all alone, you know what you do? You quit. Uh, Elijah, why did he want to quit? The Bible tells us why in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 10. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, throw down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And God would have to go and correct him and say, no, 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 no. Let's back up. You're not the only one. And can I say for those of you who are suffering a little pain tonight from serving God, and you say, I, you're not alone. There's plenty of other Christians across this nation meeting in churches tonight, tears streaming down their face, and they don't know why they're going through the pain either. They don't know why they're going through the suffering either. Can I just tell you, it's just part of the package. It's just part of the deal. Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall, shall suffer persecution. All faithful servants face this pain, but then letter B, I see, the pain does not last forever. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5 with me real quick. 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, look at verse number 10. First Peter 5 and verse number 10, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus. Notice this. After that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect. Establish, strengthen, and settle you. Can I tell you this? God says that there is coming a day where you've suffered for a little while because here on earth our life is just a little while. It is even as a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. And aren't you thankful for a day when we get up to heaven, there's no more night, no more tears, no more pain. And we'll look back and say it was worth it all. But not only that, this verse isn't talking just about heaven. This verse is talking about here on earth. In fact, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 that we should put away all anger and bitterness and malice and evil speaking. You can't do all that unless there's some healing that comes. You may be in pain and you may be suffering right now. I don't know. Maybe you suffered some sort of persecution. We don't suffer a whole lot of physical persecution in America, but maybe it was verbal. Can I say verbal persecution can be pretty rough too? Pretty rough too. The person who said sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. They had no clue what they were talking about. Words do hurt. Right. Uh, maybe it was somebody who betrayed you. Maybe it was somebody who gossiped about you. Maybe it was somebody who, who, who backstabbed you. And it hurts, and it's pain, and it's suffering. Can I just tell you, it's hurting right now, but there will come a day when it will heal. It will heal. 
And one day you'll be able to look back at it and you'll be able to touch the wound. You'll be able to pull at it and it doesn't hurt like it used to. But there is some pain that will heal. But then this pain, another fact about it is, is letter number C, there will be scars that will last a lifetime. There will be scars that will last a lifetime. Turn to Galatians with me. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter number 6. Verse number 17. Galatians 6 verse 17, Paul says, From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Paul says, hey, let me tell you something. I have some marks from serving God. I have some marks. Let me show you these scars. You know, we as a, as a people in general, we don't like to be marked up. We don't like to be scarred. Now, a guy gets a cut, and he wants it to scar up because it's a story to tell. Let me show you this thing I did to my elbow right here. I was on the house the other day, and I fell off the house and rolled down this mile-long hill, and this is how I got this scar. And guys like to get scars, but in general, we're not going out to try and get scars. We're trying to stay away from getting scars. Ladies, on the other hand, they get a scratch and they say, D -d 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 "Did it leave a leave a leave a mark? 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 Is is it is it go, 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 going to scar scar scar?" And they don't want the scars. They don't want the marks. That's why the industries have made millions and millions of dollars on selling blemish blemish creams and and coverage and certain types of band aids that are supposed to get rid of the scars. We don't want scars. We don't want marks. Paul says, hey, I bear in my body the marks. I bear in my body the marks. Paul literally had some marks from his service to God. And you say, Brother Josh, this is not encouraging me to serve God. I, I don't know what you're trying to do. Uh, you've missed a very big point. You choose, I'm not going to serve God. Uh, the marks scare me. The, the suffering and pain scare me. There's some scars that come. I don't want to serve God. So we go over here and say, I'm going to serve sin. And this is a life all the more filled with scars, but there is no blessings and there is no care of God in this life. There's no fulfilled life. There's no peace. There's no joy. There's no, none of that is over here. There's just marks and marks alone. Uh, can I take you to the home of the drug, drug addict who they've got the marks all over their arms of their service to sin? Can I take you to the ladies who, whose bruised faces and, and broken bones show the marks of the service of sin of a husband who's serving alcohol? Can I take you up to the hospital rooms of people who are on ventilators who they smoke their whole life and that's the only thing keeping them alive because of their lungs being scarred from a service of sin? Can I take you to the people who are addicted to pornography and literally I could show you pictures tonight of what the literal physical scarring that pornography does to your brain. It would shock you what it physically does to your brain when you look at pornography. The scarring. Don't think you're going to go over here and this is just the fairy tale life and we're over here in Never Never Land. This is just wonderful. Okay, sarah, sarah, whatever will be, will be. No, this is a life of scars and scars alone. At least over here I've got some blessings and I've got some peace and I've got a God who loves me and I've got a God who cares for me and I've got a master. I think I'll pick this side over here, but I'm not going to lie to you. There are going to be some scars. There will be some pain. And these scars remind us of two things. Number one, it reminds me of what we have suffered. It reminds me of what we've suffered. Paul would go on to write 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 27. He said, I bear in my, bar in my, in my body the marks. And he said this, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labor is more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, and deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, and journeyings often in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, and watchings often, in hunger and thirst, and Fastings often and cold and nakedness. Does it sound to you like the scars reminded him of what he had been through? If he can name to you how many times he's been beaten, the scars reminded him of what he had suffered. 
there will be some scars in your life that you're going to get just as part of being alive that are going to remind you of the pain you've suffered before. I, as a, I hate calling it a career. I prefer to call it a calling. I'm in full-time ministry. This is what I do. This is my life, and it's the best life ever. I love being in full-time ministry. But there are some pains that come with being in full-time ministry. There was uh, a previous pastor we had long, long time ago when I was a tiny little kid who used to say that the ministry would be great if it weren't for the people. And what he was saying was is that people can sometimes hurt you. But at the same time, anybody in full-time ministry knows people are the ministry. You invest time in them. You love them. You pray for them. You go and be a, try to be a blessing to them in their darkest times. I've been to houses before early in the morning to help people. I've held people as they've cried. I, I try to be there for people because that's the ministry is people. But at the same time, I've been on the other side where I have some scars and I remember the hurt that I've been through. Remember the hurt. I can tell you, I can still to this day, and I'm not going to, but I can still to this day tell you the name of the very first person who ever left Victory Springs Independent Baptist Church and said bad things about this church because it left some pain. It left a scar. I can tell you about the, the, the time where, where I remember I was in the office and, and preacher was on the phone and uh, somebody was yelling at him and I could hear every single word, though the phone wasn't even on speaker. And I remember tears streaming down his face as he sat there taking a mental beating. And I remember he was sitting there hurting and I was sitting there angry. And I remember he hung up that phone and tears streaming down his face. And I looked at him and I said, if that's what people are going to do to you after you invest time in them and after you love them, you can keep it. I want nothing to do with it. You say, why would you say that, Brother Josh? Hurt. Hurt. Have you ever tried to help a dog before that was hurting? What do they try to do? They try to bite you. The scars are there. I remember the first time I was ever yelled at and told that I was terrible things because I was doing my job. There's scars there. You've been there before where people have berated you or maybe you've been physically beaten or maybe whatever it may be, but you've suffered and the scars are there and they remind you, this is what I have suffered. This is what I've suffered. But can I tell you this, you, there's some pain that you'll never forget and you may have forgiven and you may have gotten past the past and you may have gotten over the bitterness, but the scars inside and or outside are still there and remind you what you have suffered. We're almost finished. I want to give you this. You have two choices when pain comes. When pain comes, you have two choices. You can either be knocked down or you can be knocked out. You can either be knocked down, which gives you the option to get back up, or you can be knocked out and the fight's over. You're, you're done. A boxer, he can either be knocked down or he can be knocked out. And you know what I've come to realize that I'm a human and my goal is to love people. You know what I've realized? Part of the package is I'm going to be hurt at some point in time. So you know what I've developed? I've developed a plan for the next time I'm hurt. Next time I've hurt, I've developed a plan. I don't know if this will be a blessing to you, but I wrote this down a couple weeks ago for the next time I'm hurt. I said this, when I'm hurt, I will respond in love. I'll respond in love. When I'm hurt, I will respond softly. When, when I'm hurt, I, I will respond in a way that the ministry will be not blamed. I, I will admit the truth. I refuse to be dishonest or misleading. I wrote down, I will not bottle up the pain, but I'll seek counsel from someone older, wiser, and with experience. I wrote down, I will not leave my current ministry or position until I have A, heard from the Lord, or B, can honestly before God say that I've forgiven and gotten past the pain. That may take some time for healing. You know what we want to do when we get hurt? We want to run. We want to run. I, I will not quit trusting God or people. I will ask God to help me forgive. I, I will learn something from the pain. I will refuse to gossip or talk bad about the person who hurt me, even if it's true. Yes, I, I wrote that down because we want to justify it by saying, well, it's true what I said. It actually happened that way. You say, what's that going to do for you, Brother Josh? I've got some other things written down there. It gives me a battle plan. 
And when the hurt comes, it's kind of like a boxer in the ring. If he's walking around with his gloves down here like this, that first punch is going to knock him off his feet. But if he knows the punches are coming and he's ready and he's prepared, well, he's going to be ready to block. He's going to be ready to run to the Lord in this idea of being ready for the pain. Last point, and we're finished. The pain reminds him and the scars remind him of what he suffered, but then the scars remind him of why he suffered. Why he suffered. Why? Why did he suffer? He suffered for the Master. That's why. He suffered for the Master. The blessing in pain is that it points me back to the Master that I'm serving. I see the scar, and I remember I did it for the Master, who should be my focus anyway. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, listen to this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Here's God. He was my master. He set me free from my sin that I was a servant to. And He he went through the suffering, and He went through the pain. And if He were here tonight, He could show you the scars, and He did it for you and me. And now when I have scars, I just remember they're for Him. That's why I got them. And I'm okay with that because that makes it worth everything. When I remember that my suffering is because I love my master. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 15 says, the Lord can help me get past the pain. Verse 15 says, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. Looking diligently at what? The verse has already told us looking unto Jesus. The verse finishes, lest any root of bitterness springing up in you trouble you and thereby many be defiled. God can help me with the bitterness. God can help me with the pain. But the pain ultimately points me back to the master that I chose to serve. And can I tell you this, if in a fight spiritually, you get knocked out instead of knocked down, your eyes were on the wrong person. Because the Bible says a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. I can get knocked down and knocked down and knocked down and knocked down, but as long as I keep my eyes on Jesus, well, I can get up and I can get up and I can get up and I can get up. Amen. I can keep getting up. When I choose to serve the master with my life, I may have pain and suffering. And by the way, can I just say pain and suffering here and there? I, I don't live a constant life of pain and suffering. This is the best life I get to live. Serving God is the best life I will ever live, but there is pain and suffering here and there. But I am promised to be cared for by him. I'm promised I will receive blessings that come alone from serving him, and I have an eternal reward in heaven waiting for me, and that makes it all worth it. I, I don't know about you, but I know for me, I, like the servant in Exodus 21, choose to serve the master. You say why. Verse 5 said, And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, I love my wife and my children, I will not go out free. Can I say I know the freedom that sin promises? I want nothing to do with it. I love my children. And if I want them to serve God and to grow up and live for Him, then my best decision I can make is to serve God with my life. I love my children. I, I love my wife. And if I want our marriage to stay the very best it can be, then the best decision I can make is to stay with my master. And can I tell you this last of all? What's the first thing he said? He said, I love my master. I love my master. He's a good pastor. He's been so good to me. Yeah, there's some times where it's hard. And yeah, there's some times where there's pain. But the service is all worth it because I love my master. Can I ask you tonight, do you love your master? With heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around tonight, if you don't mind.